All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BX Just Weekly, episode 64, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. Right, so we got um, some stuff today. Um, I'm, I've, I don't know, if you follow the my Twitter or if you are in the Discord, you might know that I've had a minor surgery this week, so I might have missed some news. If I did, please do share them with me using Twitter, Discord, or whatever the hell you want. Um, I will cover them next podcast, but yeah, we don't really have that much stuff today, but there are some very interesting things. As usual, let's start with the getting started section that covers all the basics you will ever need to know. Uh, this time around, we actually have quite a bit of very cool articles. So the first one we got here is 3GS Fundamentals. The really neat introduction to the 3GS uh, specifically and WebGL in general and how to set up the stage, how to render the shapes and how to animate them in a very basic manner. Also in includes some basic introduction to the cameras positioning and all that kind of stuff that you typically have to deal with in 3D world. So if you wanted to get into 3D programming, uh, specifically in JavaScript, obviously, and uh, didn't know where to start, then well, this article got you covered with the very basics. So if you're curious, do check it out. Next one we got here is the JavaScript object paradigm and prototypes explained simply. If you're just started learning uh, JavaScript and you're still confused about what the objects and prototypes are and how do they work together, well, this article is for you. It explains all of that in uh, pretty good details. So like it's it's quite um, in depth. And yeah, once you read it, you probably will understand a tiny bit more. Because I know this topic is not easy and it will take you quite some time to figure out completely. But uh, there you go. All right, next thing we got here is Node.js file streams explained. Um, pretty lengthy article that dip dives into the FS API and specifically stream API for working with files. They can be immensely helpful when working with a very large files or processing data on the fly. So if you are still confused as to how they work, do check this article out, it got you covered. Um, come on. Next article we got here is how to Redux with React hooks, or I would actually rephrase it a bit because this is not exactly talking about the Redux. It's actually talking about how to roll your own version of Redux by just using React hooks and React context. I already had similar articles on the podcast before, and this one basically explains the same, but maybe you will understand this one better. So the gist of it is the fact that you know you use use reducer hook to create your state and then use context to patch the dispatch uh, to pass the dispatchers around. That's basically it. If you are curious about details, do check it out. It is a decent one, I guess. All right, the next one we got here is functional JavaScript, how to use array reduce for more than just numbers. A very in-depth look to array.reduce function that is, again, as the article says, a very ubiquitous and very universal function that, well, can literally replace just about any other array method, really. And uh, yeah, it just walks you through how it works, what can you do with it, and what kind of uh, interesting things you can achieve just by using reduce, including stuff like unfold a small array to a larger array, which is uh, kind of actually interesting. So if you are getting started with arrays or maybe you've been working with them for some time and you are not quite sure about the reduce function or not sure what exactly you can do with that, then this one got you covered. This is a really, really good write-up. All right, next thing we got here is promise.race versus promise.any and promise.all versus promise.all settled, which is actually relatively new. It's been shipped just recently, right? So if you are getting into promises, but not sure about all those raise any all and all settled methods, then this article got it covered. It's a very nice comparison between all those methods and what exactly they do and uh, how exactly do they compare and where should you use them. There is also a very nice table that basically compares them in one glance. So if you are curious, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is testing Jest and Vue.js pocket guides. A pretty detailed guide on how to test Vue.js using Jest. That's basically all it does, right? So if you are getting into testing and in using Vue.js, then this guide got you covered. If you already know how all that works, then there's nothing really new here. So it's basically very, very basics of that topic. All right, uh, next thing we got here is Folding the DOM, a really cool article that talks about 3D transformations using CSS. And uh, this demo on the screen of a folding uh, image is essentially what you're gonna be building. 
it does guide you through all the things you need to do to achieve that step by step. It's a really cool one. And all of the examples it gives are actually interactive. So you can actually see what exactly happens when you do different transformations in CSS. It is really cool. Yes, it is indeed very neat. And I think it's one of the best guides on CSS transformations I have seen because it's very interactive and it's really easy to understand what exactly is going on because you literally can just move the sliders around, you know, it's really, really cool. Um, so yeah, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Right, next thing we got here is three approaches for using Google Sheets API in Node.js, a tutorial. Um, just as the title says, this is a tutorial on how to use Google Sheets as a database essentially and access it using Node.js. Uh, it talks about uh, three different ways, um, specifically uh, old API that are gonna be deprecated at one point, the new API that use OAuth and um, what is the third method actually? I don't remember already. Um, was there a third method? I think it's, yeah. Oh yeah, right. The uh, just all with, with the Google spreadsheet package, right? So it's basically the same as the second, but just slightly different. So if you are curious on how to, you can integrate the Google, um, Google spreadsheets into your app, then this one is for you. It's basically got you covered. All right, and I think that is actually, no, it's not the last guide. We are still getting there. The next article we got here is the 8020 guide to promises in Node.js. Um, this is for all of you people who are just starting working with JavaScript and are still confused as to what promises are, how do they work and why exactly do you need them and how to use them. So this guide you covered, it's a pretty brief article, but I think it does a pretty good job of explaining um, what is the promises, how do they work and how exactly you use them. So if you're still confused about that, do check it out. Next article we got here is how to create cool interactive sun key diagrams using JavaScript. And I, I so just until reading this article, I actually thought this, those diagrams were called snaky diagrams. And I was like, wait, sun key? Is that, is that correct? And turns out, yes, I'm an idiot. And it's actually not snaky, but it's sun key. And all my life I've been calling them snaky diagrams. I don't know why, but. <laughs> But there you go. So if you wanted to know how to build a basic Sankey diagrams, uh, specifically using any chart.js library, which is quite nice. And this tutorial does a really good job of doing that. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're basic, they are look neat. And yes, they are snaky. I, I don't know why I thought they would call it this way. But <laughs> so yes, if you want to build uh, Sankey diagrams using any chart.js, then this is a really good tutorial. Okay, and the last one in the getting started section we got today is the visual regression testing with Puppeteer using Create React Tab, TypeScript, and Jest. A pretty neat introduction into how to set up the visual regression testing using Puppeteer for making snapshots essentially and then comparing them using your test environment, which is a pretty straightforward approach, but you know, it works quite well. So if you wanted to do visual testing, then this is a really good starting guide. Do check it out. All right, now we are coming to the articles uh, and news section. The first article we got here today is called JavaScript Clean Code Best Practices. This is um, sort of a summary of a clean code book that is aligned with the JavaScript code. So if you never heard about the clean code book, it, it, blah, let me try that again. If you never heard about the clean code book, it's actually a really good one and I would highly recommend reading it if you care about the quality of your code. But uh, this article actually does a very good job of summarizing the very basics of the clean code book, I guess, and uh, presenting them in a JavaScript form. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. There's definitely a good of, uh, like a, quite a bunch of uh, good advices that you will definitely use on a daily basis if you uh, pay close attention, I guess. But then again, you know, it's a good starting point, but if you really care about your code, I would highly suggest reading the actual book. But nonetheless, it's a really good article and a very well written summary of it, basically. All right, next article we got here is an elegant error handling with the JavaScript either monad. Yes, monads. Thing that almost nobody understands that is actually immensely useful. So either monad was one of those things that have been kind of eye-opening to me when I started figuring out uh, functional programming. Once I figured out how the, what are the monads are and how exactly do they work, I stumbled upon this either monad that uh, seemingly made error handling um, almost effortless, I guess, you know, and way, way nicer to work with than doing try catch. 
So if you are getting into functional programming and if you are already at the point where you know what the monads are, then this one is for you. It's a really good description of either monad and how does it help you to handle errors in a way better way. Way better way. <laughs> that is terrible. Um, and yes, it basically explains how to better handle errors using this either monad. So if you don't quite understand what monads are, I would suggest reading first something on that specific topic and then coming back to this a bit later because it does assume that you have a basic knowledge of monads uh, before you can actually understand what the hell is going on. But uh, nonetheless, it's a really good article. All right, continuing, we got solving puzzles with high performance JavaScript. Uh, this is for all of you people who like different lit code puzzles and other stuff that pushes you to build the most sophisticated solutions, I guess, to the silly problems. And um, in this case, the author here talks about a couple of specific lit code problems uh, where he tried to optimize them to be faster than all the other submissions that were submitted to this specific problem. So there's, uh, I think, two or three problems here and it's really interesting to see how you know how you could specifically optimize for those problems another interesting point within the article is not not you know not just the pure logic as in you know okay so we have this algorithm that is actually o n squared but we could go to o n if we use a set and then this is just the you know the lo like programming logic but um, the other part is actually optimizing for a specific engine. So in this case, the author talks about the, the fact that the lead code uses Node.js version 10.15, which is not even the latest LTS, but kind of okay-ish, I guess. And there are known caveats and known issues there, right? So you cannot actually just, like you can't just write um, idiomatic code and, and hope that it's gonna work okay because there are known caveats of using the older versions of Node, the older versions of V8. So there are some specific discussions of uh, this as well, specifically for the, I think that was the Fibonacci number problem that uh, was related to that. So one of the comments below suggested that you can actually solve this puzzle by just using mathematics, which makes perfect sense because you know Fibonacci puzzle is well Fibonacci sequence, which is mathematics. And the problem is that while you can use mathematics, it will actually be slower than the naive iterating solution, which is a bit interesting, right? So um, if you are into performance tuning and if you are curious about those kind of puzzles, do check it out. There's some pretty interesting discussion and the write up here. All right, continuing, we got const assertions are the new killer TypeScript feature. Um, yeah, I don't know much about TypeScript, as you might know from uh, watching the previous episodes, but uh, basically yeah, you got a new const assertion that says that thing is now more const than it was before, I guess. I'm not exactly sure what is going on here, but it's a pretty detailed write-up on it. Uh, so if you're using TypeScript and if you are also confused about what const assertions are, then this article is for you. Make sure to check it out. Continuing, we got my experience from moving, uh, sorry, my experience moving from Enzyme to React testing library. Another write up on uh, the migration from Enzyme, which is the, I guess, oldest and the most established testing library for React, to React testing library, which is the sort of new ish um, testing library developed by Mr. Kensi Dodds. And that is extremely easy to use, by the way. So I think I use it in majority of my new projects now. And uh, this is sort of a story of how the author migrated the existing project from Enzyme to React Testing Library. What kind of challenges did he face? What kind of changes did he have to do? And majority of it is actually non-technical. It's more of a conceptual talk as to, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of things do you have to keep in mind? What kind of changes do you have to do to your code base? to actually make the React testing library work and how do you have to think about your tests because it is slightly differs from actually using the enzyme because the approaches are you know quite different. So if you are using enzyme and considering to move to React testing library maybe or maybe you're evaluating both of them and trying to figure out which one to use then this article is for you. Right, continuing we got how to build runnable JavaScript specification. So this one's talking about uh, the well, text specifications that you can run using JavaScript, specifically in this case about custom format that the author came up here using the template literals. 
and how you can actually build a runner that would evaluate that and actually um, evaluate the inline templates that you get or inline values that you get in a template and display that as a proper working spec, which is a nice exercise. So I don't think I would um, like, obviously there's gonna be a very basic version of a spec runner, but it's nonetheless a pretty cool exercise. So if that's area is interesting to you, definitely check this one out. All right, the next thing we got here is WebAssembly at eBay, a real world use case. A pretty cool write up on uh, one of the issues that um, eBay folks encountered when working with the uh, uh, web and WebAssembly specifically. Uh, and it's related to the barcode scanning, right? So they had the, they have their own C++ um, barcode scanner that they use in iOS and Android. And it works perfectly well in iOS and Android. Um, you know, this is their experience. So they were like, okay, so we're gonna just use WebAssembly, compile it for web and just use it in our browser version as well, right? So it sounds simple enough. Well, it turns out it's not quite that simple. So because there was a bunch of problems uh, and obviously, so there's like a different technical discussions, you know, like offloading the work into the worker so that it doesn't uh, clogs the main thread and so on and so forth. But the interesting thing is that it was fast. So it was like 50 times faster than the naive JavaScript implementation, but it quite wasn't quite as good as on the native uh, for a bunch of reasons. And if you're curious to check them out. So what they ended up doing to increase the precision of it is actually using three different implementations in three parallel workers. So they have worker one with an existing ZBar library, which is also C++ uh, barcode scanning library. They just compiled it to WebAssembly and thrown it into the web worker, which seems to work quite well. Then they have their own custom library running in the worker. And the third worker is the naive JavaScript leap. And then they basically just give the same image to all three and wait for whoever for first finds the barcode, right? Um, I'm also, I'm like on one hand, this is really fascinating and cool. On the other hand, I'm kind of curious, how does this impact the performance and battery life on a mobile devices? Because running three different implementations and three different workers on mobile device cannot be efficient, right? Like it's, it's gotta have quite a heavy toll on the performance. So while the completion rate and while the uh, precision of the detection is quite high, I wonder what's the performance implication of the whole thing. But nonetheless, it's a really cool article. So if you're curious about the WebAssembly world, then definitely do check this one out. It's a really good write-up. All right, continuing, we got strict null checking Visual Studio Code. A deep dive into how the team uh, behind the Visual Studio Code uh, applied strict null checking from TypeScript to the whole code base when it was actually not enabled and what kind of problems did this solve. So again, if you're a TypeScript uh, developer, definitely check this one out. There's some interesting uh, guides and you know a story of how they uh, exactly enabled it. All right, continuing, we got uh, measuring interactivity with time to interactive. This is, I guess, a deep dive into what time to interactive is, how do you use it, why is it important, and what kind of caveats apply when you are trying to measure it. So if you are working on a website that you want to be uh, perceived as fast, I guess, uh, then definitely check this one out. There is a lot of very interesting thoughts in here. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just a really good article. Uh, it's non-technical, so majority of it is just conceptual and um, things that you have, have to keep in mind essentially, but it's a pretty good article nonetheless. Okay, I think that is actually it for articles and news. Now we're coming to the shorter bits and, and awesome things. Uh, the first one is the Microsoft Edge preview builds uh, have been released for macOS. So if you're a Mac user, you can now download Microsoft Edge that is built on Chrome uh, or Chromium actually and uh, run it on Mac. And uh, it's actually <laughs> blazingly fast. I am, I seriously cannot wait until Microsoft releases Edge as a stable browser and then just swap my Google Chrome for it and I'll probably use it everywhere. The only thing I've been missing is the synchronization between my phone and the desktop, but I'm hoping they will also have a mobile version at 1.2 because it is like, it looks really good. And yeah, they even support the touch bar, which is kind of awesome. This like the tab thing on touch bar looks really great. Um, so yes, if you are a Mac user, do check it out. Next thing we got here is the class API proposal for Vue.js is being dropped for a bunch of reasons. So if you are using Vue.js and you were looking 
forward to classes. I guess this is a bit of a disappointment. If you were not looking to classes, then, well, you know, you didn't lose much. There is quite a long, lengthy write-up as to why exactly it was dropped. The arguments honestly make a lot of sense. And uh, I don't know, I personally, you know, as I already mentioned multiple times, prefer functional programming to classes anyway. So that's, I don't think that's a big deal for me anyway. So, but, you know, just check it out if you're curious. There is a really good write-up as to what problems are there with classes and why did they decide to drop it in the first place. Next thing we got here is the new announcement by the GitHub. GitHub launched GitHub Sponsors, which is a way to fund open source that matters to you essentially. So um, it's basically like Patreon integrated into the GitHub, right? So the cool thing is that they will give all the money that people contribute to your project directly to you. Even the processing fees at first will go, uh, so basically they will cover them, which is kind of neat. And uh, after one year or 5,000 US dollars, you will basically be uh, charged for the processing fees, which makes perfect sense. And then we'll get the rest of money. So they don't actually take any percentages or anything like this, which is really cool. And the coolest part is that you can actually just go to uh, someone's profile and you will see the fund button. You will see the projects he does, short description of what, why should you sponsor him written by the author himself. And then you will see a tiers that you can basically select. Um, there's already a discussion going on around we will, you know, on how this will impact the projects. Will the people prioritize um, the backers essentially and so on and so forth. And uh, yes, obviously this will, this will impact the development, right? But this is a really cool way to support open source. Um, I feel like a lot of, a lot of, of um, a lot of open source development is going to change in the near future because of this. Is it going to be for worse or for better? We're going to find out in about a year, I guess. But um, yeah, give something like issue sponsors. Uh, that's, I mean, I, I I feel like this is an experiment in this, you know? So it seems like they, okay, there was like, you know, there's an existing model, which is the Patreon, which is working, right? So there's, there's already like, for example, if you take Sindrosaurus, he has a pretty big Patreon following and this is essentially how he lives right now. They're like, okay, let's try copying that and see how it works. If this is going to be popular, I'm sure they're going to expand on it. And um, again, what I'm more curious about is like, this is cool, no questions asked, right? But what I'm curious about is to uh, how this will actually impact the development of the project. So I think issue sponsoring is a really cool way of literally giving people a way to say, hey, here's like money if you close this issue, right? This is really awesome. Like we already have a project like this. There's the, what was it? Issue Hunt, I think. Yes, there is this Issue Hunt uh, website that basically does this, right? So uh, what the hell is going on? Let me just allow my JavaScript real quick. Uh, what? No, uh, ad block. What is happening? There we go, finally works. So there's this issue hunt that essentially allows you to do exactly this, right? So there's the issues that have assigned bounties to them. And once you close the issue, you can redeem that bounty. And there's like a ton of different projects that have the bounties on them. If, and I'm feeling, you know, if this sponsors experiment is successful, this is probably going to be the next thing integrated directly into GitHub which is great, don't get me wrong. But uh, again, you know, I think this is gonna change the open source uh, landscape quite a bit. Nonetheless, pretty cool, so let us continue. Next uh, minor announcement we got here is Preact has actually moved to a new home on GitHub. So it's now hosted under preact.js slash preact and you can sponsor it, which is also quite neat. So uh, sponsorship is now, by the way, in beta. So not all projects, not all users um, yet have it but they are basically slowly expanding it. So um, yeah, we're getting there. And uh, yes, Preact now has a new home. Yeah, you can now sponsor it and it's basically great. So if you are curious to check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is the uh, minor thing from PM2. So if you're using it, uh, you might have noticed that it, it could have caused uh, CI builds to fail because they have an optional dependency, a package called GK, uh, GK, God damn it. <laughs> GKT, it's really hard to say for me for some reason. Um, so this package is a tarball from their server, which literally consists of one file that says console log smarty smart smarter. And essentially it was a smart way of tracking installs, which I guess would be fine, 
but occasionally their server went down and you would get 503 requesting that package so you couldn't actually run install. Um, there's an issue that discusses that they fixed it first, but the interesting bit is that, you know, the credit where credit is due, they actually uh, patched it out. So the new version of uh, PM2, which is, what was it? There was a discussion just right here. Um, there we go, PM351, they actually removed it completely and they are now looking into other better ways of doing tele non-invasive telemetry within the PM2 that would not crash if one of their servers dies essentially. So this is great, but on the other hand, you know, this kind of a very silly way of handling telemetry, but uh, there you go. <laughs> All right, next thing we got here is what does React Beautiful D&D cost to maintain? A pretty neat write-up uh, sort of very in-depth insight into maintaining a high ranking, high quality open source project. So React Beautiful D&D is a really neat React drag and drop library. And uh, yeah, if you were ever curious, uh, what does it cost human wise and money wise to maintain something as big and as, as popular as this, then this write up is basically for you. So do check it out. There's some really interesting um, points here that I haven't even thought about personally. So it's it's kind of awesome. So if you're interested in open source, I basically highly recommend looking at that. All right, that is it for the tiny bits and stuff. So we're now coming to the releases section. The first major release of the week is Firefox 67. It comes uh, with the new content blocking that allows you to block known crypto miners and fingerprinters in the custom settings. So this is now integrated into the Firefox itself. There's a bunch of other improvements. Uh, I think one of the most notable features is the web render that's gonna be gradually enabled for uh, Windows 10 desktops with NVIDIA graphic cards for now as a testing phase. So if you never heard about web render is the new Firefox rendering engine that is basically GPU powered and supposed to be way faster than the one they had before, which is honestly quite exciting. So let's see how that ends actually. The next release we got here is Node.js version 12.3. The highlight of this release being the experimental WebAssembly modules uh, with a flag. We talked about them last uh, podcast, I believe. So you can now enable this flag and try them out in your latest Node.js installation if you have it. Other than that, there's a bunch of other minor changes, so nothing uh, noteworthy, I believe. Next release we got here is Material UI version 4.0 which brings uh, quite a bunch of different things, including the higher, uh, basically easier way to customize it, as well as better docs and smaller bundle sizes. So if you were working with it, so make sure to update. If not, then maybe check it out. Maybe this is the library you were looking for. It's quite nice. I mean, it's, you know, uh, it's quite heavy. Again, it's like almost um, 80 kilobytes uh, minge, minge zipped if you bundle the whole thing, but, it is very nice looking library. So if you want a material look and uh, work with React, do check this one out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. Next release we got here is ExpressJS version 4.17. This is not exactly a notable release, but I wanted to highlight it because this is the first release of ExpressJS in half a year, I think. They did release, so there is, if you didn't know, there is um, Express work on ExpressJS uh, version 5 going on, which is going to be like a sync await compatible and everything. And they actually released alpha back in October, but since then there hasn't been no more releases or I'm not even sure, I, I guess the development is active because there's quite a bunch of comments happening pretty much, uh, well, at least weekly. So there you go. It's, um, I mean... It's an extremely popular framework, but the, you know, since essentially TJ moved to the Golang world, it's been very slow in development, I guess. But nonetheless, you know, it's, it's still a nice framework and still worthy of using, so there you go. All right, uh, last thing I gotta highlight here for releases is actually Pixie JS v5, which was released back in April, and I somehow missed that. If you never heard about Pixie JS, it's a really neat rendering engine that allows you to render, well, a ton of things on the screen, and uh, it's now actually comes with WebGL by default and is a first um, um, first class citizen of Pixie.js. So if you're working with the graphics, make sure to check it out because it is actually really good. Like uh, I've used it in a couple of projects to do some uh, nice visualizations and it allows you to do some really cool things. And this is terrifying. And uh, yes, it's a lot of flying tiny things. 
it's very performant, very easy to use, and has basically everything you want to you might want to have from the rendering engine. Right, that is it for the releases. Now we're coming to the libraries and demos section, and um, the first thing we got here is awesome Vasi created list that uh, collects everything related to WebAssembly Vasi ecosystem. So. If you are interested in WebAssembly Vasi um, and wanted to know more about it, I guess this is a pretty nice collection of things so far. And I'm guessing this is just going to grow more and more because the WebAssembly seems to be taking over the web, honestly. It's like not just, you know, within the web, even within the edge and stuff. Like we talked about the Intel building their own WebAssembly engine last time, right? So this is, this is getting crazy. So if you're interested, do check it out. Uh, next thing we got here is Relift HTML, a very small, just three kilobyte view library that is packed. It's basically web components, custom element, template literals, reactive data bindings, two-way data bindings, whatever the hell you can imagine. So basically very simplified way to work with the web components in just three kilobytes. So if you are curious about that, do check it out. Seems quite nice. Next thing we got here is unform, a React form library to create uncontrolled form structures with nested fields, validations, and much more. Uh, seems to be a pretty uh, detailed and pretty feature rich form library for React. So if you're working with forms a lot, do check it out. Maybe this is exactly what you wanted. Uh, it seems way more um, declarative, let's put it this way, than say formic because uh, you essentially work off the data structure rather than the other way around. Um, seems quite nice. So yeah, you know, maybe this is what you were looking for. Next thing we got here is Polytype, a dynamic multiple inheritance for JavaScript and TypeScript without mixins. A tiny library that allows you to extend multiple classes uh, by using the decorator function essentially, which I, I mean, Again, you know, I already talked about that, but I am a functional programming person. And every time I see complex place, complex class structures, it always hurts my brain. It always is very, very hard to understand in general, if you have a, you know, complex inheritance structure and classes where the methods, for example, come from, unless you have a very good ID that shows this to you. But then again, you know, it's, I don't know, I just, my brain is wired differently, I guess. And I just, it, 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 it's a bit painful to think about it this way, but maybe you're working with op um, heavily and maybe this is the use case you had. Maybe you needed to extend a bunch of classes and maybe this is exactly what you were looking for. Again, please use it with care and don't just blindly extend everything because this can lead into some code that is very hard to read, but there you go. All right, continuing, we got hyper OOP, uh, object oriented programming style, single page application micro framework that looks very similar to basically React. Um, uh, yeah, it seems to be like all in one thing with uh, TypeScript uh, built in from the ground and uh, the JSX or TSX, I guess, used as a basic template language. Um, so if you were looking for something like this, maybe do check it out, maybe not. It's, I mean, yeah, it's just another one of those. All right, continuing, we got React 808, eight rate drum machine built using React JS hooks API. This is literally what it is. It's a drum machine and you can do sick bits with it and it's all React and hooks. It's a really nice learning material, I guess. Doesn't have any unit tests if this is what you were looking for. So it's just, um, just a bit of code. All right, continuing, we got Tornis. Uh, Tornis helps you watch and respond to changes in your browser's viewports. So this is, uh, well, they have, first of all, they have a really slick website. Uh, it has a really nice like effect over here and it's not exactly a parallax library, but it's sort of, um, as the author himself notes, is a torn is as a store for your viewport. So the idea is that it allows you to monitor the changes in a viewport, including the mouse position, velocity, viewport size, scroll position and scroll velocity and react to that using functions which basically allows you to do parallax or a bunch of other different things. And it's, yeah, it seems to be quite nice actually. So if you were looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is React RPM, uh, Chrome DevTools that provides real time performance and efficiency uh, measurements for React applications. So it's uh, again, you know, Dev, uh, Chrome DevTools extension with a bunch of extended uh, performance metrics for React apps. So if you're working with React and 
working with performance a lot, do check it out. This might be exactly what you wanted to have. Next thing we got here is SCAR, uh, deploy static websites in seconds with HTTPS, a global CDN and a custom domains to Amazon Web Services specifically. So sort of all in one recipe that allows you to do that. There is a very complex diagram as it typically tends to happen with, <laughs> with Amazon Web Service deployments as to exactly how that works. And as you can see here, it uses the Amazon Web Services Lambdas, S3 buckets and uh, CloudFront and uh, ACM certificates from Amazon to do all of that stuff. So yes, if you were curious as to how exactly you can do uh, static deployments to Amazon Web Services, do check this one out. I guess it's a good learning point, but I don't know if I would use that um, myself because I mean, just by looking at that, this is so complex just to deploy a simple static website, right? I don't know, like where, all right, you know what? Let's just, let's just continue. All right, so continuing, we got React Gesture Responder, a gesture responder system for your React application. Has a really nice uh, demo here that basically mimics the iOS, which you can swipe up and uh, navigate the screens by using swipe gestures. And you can also pull down um, the search and stuff. And yeah, it seems, seems to be pretty slick. So if you wanted a full on gesture responder system for your React app, then check it out. This seems to be quite good. Continue, we got level down, a pure C++ Node.js level DB bindings. Um, yeah, just as it says, you know, if you wanted to work with level DB through C++ with your Node.js, which I guess probably gonna give you less overhead than uh, doing the JavaScript version of that. And do check it out. I personally never actually work with level DB, so I cannot really say much about that, but uh, there you go. Continuing, we got a wait timeout, a promise based API for set timeout, clear timeout, uh, essentially the nice uh, API that allows you to await a timer. Um, worth noting, so I had a quick look through the code um, because this, this example here confused me for a second. So the example here has a race, uh, race condition, right? So you await promise race, you await fetch, or you await a timer of one second that then rejects with a specific error, right? Now, this is all cool and stuff, but there is this finally clause that says timer.clear. I was like, why would you need to clear a timer if it's a race condition, right? Theoretically, even if one of them rejects, then the other one, once it resolves somehow, would be just thrown out because this race already resolved. Well, it turns out this timeout is actually a singleton and it uses one timeout in the background to do everything. So you cannot actually use it in multiple places at the same time. So just keep that in mind when you're using it. Nonetheless, it's, you know, it's, it has a nice API and stuff. Uh, so maybe you were looking for something like this. All right, next thing we got here is Simple Parallax, a simple JavaScript library that gives your website parallax animations on any images. Uh, it's, yeah, very straightforward, very easy to use. You can do parallax with just about everything you want. Looks quite nice. So if you wanted to do parallax images scrolling around, then check it out, it's very easy to use. And yes, it is jQuery based, so uh, make sure that you have jQuery in your project as well. Next thing we got here is React Image Magnifiers, an image with the magnifying that you can do by, well, like 20 different ways basically, what you typically see on, on uh, e-commerce websites, I guess. All of that works quite nicely. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it one, uh, blah, do check this one out. All right, next thing we got here is React Designer, editable vector graphics in your React app. This one is really awesome. It literally allows you to edit graphics and dynamically change the SVGs right in place. This, this is very cool. Like this is, this is just great. Um, first time I launched it, I've been playing with it for like 20 minutes, I think. Um, you can even do freeform shapes, which like, how cool is this? <laughs> And all of that is a simple React component. And yes, there's like stuff, you know, like, hey, you can actually do mockups or you can do a t-shirt designs or you can do whatever the hell you want because it's just SVG essentially. So that sounds interesting. Do check it out. It is really, really cool. All right, next thing we got here is sync.env. Keep your .env and .env.example in sync. Essentially a very tiny package that allows you to generate .env.example for your projects automatically by um, 
yeah, just synchronizing it with your current.env, which is not committed to the repo, which can be quite nice from time to time. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I ever had a problem that I had to do that, but um, maybe you do, maybe you do this a lot. So uh, it seems quite handy. All right, and the last thing we got here is WebGL Fluid Simulation that looks absolutely gorgeous. If you ever wanted to do WebGL Fluid Simulations or maybe you just wanted to, you know, look at this and play around with this as I did. I think once I opened it, I sit here for like 10 minutes tweaking the different sliders and doing this stuff. Um, it is really cool and uh, my eyes are melting. There we go, let's just make it like this. It's really awesome and it's open source on GitHub. So if you want to see how exactly it was done, you can do so and check it out. And it is, yeah, it's, it's just great. Right, that is it for libraries and demos. Before we wrap this up, I just want to highlight a new thingy here. Uh, so you might know or might not know that there is a company called Oculus that does virtual reality. And they just released Oculus VR headset. Um, by the way, I'm not, you know, I'm not sponsored, not funded by them or anything. I just bought one myself. And it's all in one device that you just buy and you can play games with it without connecting it to computer or anything. It costs for hundred US dollars or, you know, plus minus few euro, depending on where you are or a few dollars, I guess. And it is mind blowing. If you ever had any slightest interest in VR, just do yourself a favor, find it somewhere in a shop or whatever, find a demo and try it. Believe me, it is mind blowing. Like this thing is probably the best purchase I've made in the past five years, I guess. It is awesome. So yes, if you have, again, if you have even slightest interest in VR, definitely check this one out. All right, this was it for me, I guess. Um, yeah, this is basically all I have. If you guys have any questions, suggestions, or links I might have missed, and there might be quite a lot this week, as I said, because of my surgery, uh, feel free to throw them into the chat right now. Again, if you have any questions to ask, feel free to ask them right away. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, ask uh, in the comments. As usual, we have a Discord chat that you can join if you wanna discuss JavaScript stuff, video games, or just wanna talk to people about software development. Uh, or if you have any JavaScript problems, we'll be more than happy to help you. Um, yeah, I guess that's basically it from my side. Um, right, there is the point of a uh, live stream. So I promised I would live stream Svelte but unfortunately, again, due to my surgery, everything went to hell. So I guess we're gonna skip that and go directly to the code review live stream. So if you guys have any codes that you want me to review, please join our Discord server and send it over my way. I will do the first code review stream on Wednesday with like one of the projects that I basically will pick. We're gonna do a pretty detailed uh, code review along with a sort of project review, looking at documentation, readme, and so on and so forth. And uh, yes, this is basically it from my side. All right, doesn't seem like we have any questions or suggestions. Nobody seems to wanna to share the articles or anything like that. So I guess we can wrap this live stream up. Um, it's been BXS Weekly episode 64. As usual, if you missed it, the VOD will be on the Twitch immediately or on YouTube in a couple of hours. You can find all the mentioned links on the GitHub and uh, or bxjs.dev website. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for your continued support. I hope you enjoyed the live stream and I see you next time. Bye.